Hello, and welcome to NACTV Reads the News. My name is Jackie Snyder, and today I am reading the Nipah Press of Wednesday, May the 31st. Now, these uh, weekly uh, press readings would not be possible without uh, the support from our viewers right across Canada. And uh, this, this support comes both in the form of monetary support and volunteer help. So it is very, very much appreciated. We have a great staff here that uh, know what they're doing and get, keep us on the air each week. So we're very appreciative to that about that. If you would like to help us out, uh, you can uh, contact us at 204-476-2639 or you can send us an email nactv at wcgwave.ca and we would love to hear from you in any way if you have criticisms or kudos uh, let us know okay getting to the paper it's not too thick this week, but there's lots of uh, pictures and they tell a great story. So the, on the front page, this photo was taken by Becky Yavato, And it looks like maybe these are her children on the front page. Left to right, brothers Grayson and Luca Yavato enjoying themselves at the Nippon District Chamber of Commerce Fair. Throughout the weekend, there were large crowds at the Midway. Additional pictures of the Nippon Fair can be seen on page eight, and we will get there eventually. <coughs> so now turning over to page two, and this is the Looking Back section research by Cecil Pittman. We'll go to the picture first of all, because this is a picture that is 98 years old. 98 years ago, July 1st, 1919, Nipah Boys Band at the fairgrounds in Nipah. And wasn't it great in the olden days? And it doesn't, the olden days don't go back all that far. When we used to get together and uh, there was no television in those days, so get togethers were um, the way we uh, entertained each other and um, visited. So, uh, those were the great, those were great days. No phones even in those days. So 80 years ago, Tuesday, May 25th, 1937. Last Friday, George M. Devison of Arden advertised purebred pigs for sale in the press. The advertisement was ordered for three issues, but Saturday afternoon he phoned to cancel it as he had received more inquiries than could be accommodated. Mr. Devison was more than satisfied with the result, is, is now a firm believer in advertising. To sell, you must tell, and a special notice in the press speaks to a vast audience. So that was 80 years ago. 70 years ago, Thursday, May 29, 1947, Manitoba, the first, the first province to establish a system of allowances to families in need, through the death or disability of the father, extended the mother's allowance May 1st, 1947, to include the widow or wife of a disabled person with one child. Prior to this date, except in certain instances, provincial allowances were granted only when the family included two or more children under 15 years of age. And 60 years ago, Thursday, May 30th, 1957, Irvine Ritchie, age 62, lived on a farm near Franklin and was killed instantly at 7.40 p.m. on Tuesday when he was stuck, struck by a CPR freight train at a railway crossing one and a half miles west of Franklin. Mr. Ritchie was apparently returning home from Minnedosa at the time of the accident. RCMP are investigating and Minnedosa coroner Dr. H.C. Stevenson stated that he believed that an inquest would be held. And 50 years ago, with the start of Manitoba's new 5% revenue tax, now only two days away, businessmen in Nipua and district are making final preparations to handle the necessary changes in their operation, 
to look after the collection of the tax on taxable items. The sales tax goes into force Thursday, June 1st, and with that date staring them in the face, the business community showed a great deal of interest and in a special Chamber of Commerce meeting last Friday at the Town Hall to discuss the implementation of the revenue tax. And 40 years ago, members of the Lions Club Band thoroughly entertained over 200 people at the Lions Club Band Supper special held last Wednesday, May 18th. The audience was treated to band selections ranging from rock music and rhinestone cowboy to their festival selection and such moody songs as Feelings, all under the direction of Ted Good. And 30 years ago, a declining population in the town of, oh, so 30 years ago, this was Thursday, May 28th, 1987, a declining population in the town of Nipawa could mean the town receives less in provincial municipal tax sharing funds in the future. In the past, the funds were calculated using data from 1982. Now, however, the census data shows Nipawa's population went down. According to Nipawa Secretary Treasurer Dale Lyle, population decides the amount of the grant, but they, the province, agreed to lessen the blow by decreasing it gradually. And I'm skipping over to 10 years ago, Monday, May 26, 2007. The Canadian dollar surged to a new 30-year high of 91 cents U.S. last Friday, the highest it's been since October 1977. The strong dollar was fueled by retail sales, which surged 1.9% in the month to $34, I'm sorry, $34 billion, boosting sales for this quarter by 2%. Manitobans were part of the March spending spree. Statistics Canada reported retail sales in the province jumped 2.3% from February to March. $1.17 billion compared to $1.14 billion. It was the third highest percentage gain in the country behind only Saskatchewan and Alberta. Now there is an ad at the bottom of page two, an ad announcement, I guess you'd say. It's uh, from the Nipah Library. Diane Bryden presents the stalwart Brian Brydens. Join us for Diane's presentation of how she and her father researched and verified the stories of this longtime family of Manitoba. And this is taking place this week, uh, this day that you're seeing this reading, Thursday, June 1st at 5.30 p.m. And most of you know where the library is across from the Royal Bank, but it's at 280 Davidson Street. And if you need information, the phone number is 204-476-5648. Now over to page three. This is the opinion page. Now, this is the new column. I guess it's going to be a weekly column. And this is entitled Unexpected News. And this is Kevin Slimp's The Good Fo Folks of Lennox Valley. Valley unprepared for approaching storm. The home of my childhood rests snugly between two lakes with names descended from ancient indigenous people. It's been a while since I've had a mailing address in the valley and a lot of things have changed through the years. A milestone occurred in 1993 when our first traffic light was installed on the corner of Main and Church Street. We still refer to that intersection as Bearden's Corner, though no one is quite sure why. At first there was a lot of excitement concerning the light. The Lutherans, who occupied the northwest quadrant of the corner, thought the light might encourage those who waited there to consider dropping by. It was the ultimate evangelism tool. The Baptists, on the other hand, occupied the southeast quadrant of Bearden's Corner. There was great concern among members of First Baptist Church that the light would encourage drivers to consider a visit to the Hofbra, a German eatery that caused considerable chagrin among the Baptists, who recognized it 
as the only establishment near their church that served beer. The bra, as locals had come to know it, was the subject of at least six sermons at the Baptist Church since it first opened on the corner in 1951. One of Brother Billy Joe's favorite sermons was titled, You Can't Spell Devil Without Evil, and referenced the bra at least once during each of his three points. After a while, parishioners came to expect Brother Billy Joe's sermon on evil every year on the Sunday before Oktoberfest. On the other hand, Father O'Reilly, priest at All Saints Catholic Church, seemed to have no problem with the Hofbra. As a matter of record, if Bira Pinrod's phone calls to the members of the Lenox Valley Auburn Hat Society can be considered record, the good father, as she liked to call him, often was often seen enjoying a Reuben sandwich, sauerkraut, and a Bud Light at the famed eatery. What's more, Father O'Reilly seemed to have no interest in Vera's declarations concerning his dining habits. Some thought he was taking a personal jab at Vera when on the Sunday before Mother's Day, he led a homily on the subject, the devil wears a bright red hat. Everybody thought the confrontation between Vera and Father O'Reilly would calm down in time, but with each passing year, it seemed to gain steam. That was until Vera's attention turned to something more important. As you will soon learn, my hometown never lacked drama. Just when we thought things were settling down, another earth-shaking event would stir us to attention. This was especially true in 1998. You see, the Bishop of the Anglican Church decided to appoint a new pastor to the valley in June. Anglicans do this now and then, and pastoral changes usually occur without too much fanfare. Nobody would know about the change for another month or so, but the bishop had made the decision and soon would be sending word to the good folks at Lenox Valley Anglican Church. Bishop Jen Wedby would soon have the privilege of informing the expectant congregation. The new pastor's name was Reverend Sarah Hyden Smith and everybody thought the traffic light was big news. <laughs> that sounds like it's gonna be a good column. <clears throat> so still on page three, uh, there's a letter to the editor and it comes from the Taxpayers Federation, I believe. Aaron Woodrick, Federal Director, Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Last week, Federal Innovation Minister Navdeep Baines announced new details about the federal government's plan to grow Canada's economy, hand out nearly a billion dollars in taxpayer money to a few businesses who are willing to ask for it. <coughs> to the minister's credit, he had the good sense not to express it in such candid terms. In the rich tradition of rhetorical poll polybabble, he chose far more exciting phrases such as, <coughs> excuse me, jump-starting innovation, meaningful economic activity, and superclusters. But try as he might to apply lipstick to the pig, it's still the same old swine underneath. Governments handling, handing out taxpayer money to favored businesses is the oldest trick in the industrial strategy playbook. The minister himself admitted as much when pressed, suggesting his government, government was simply copying the approaches of other governments around the world. Apparently, the minister didn't look hard enough. From biotechnology in Italy to a purpose-built Russian tech park, to millions wasted from Germany to Singapore, the number of failed attempts by governments to create industry clusters is long and expensive. No matter how hard they try, governments are not very good at predicting the next big economic trend. But maybe Canada can learn something, lear can learn from their mistakes. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a frog in my throat today. 
Don't bet on it. The Trudeau government hasn't even learned from the mistakes of previous federal governments in Canada, which spent at least $12 billion over the last half century on corporate welfare with zero evidence of job creation. Meanwhile, the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy at the University of Ottawa estimates the federal government already has 147 different programs and tax measures aimed at innovation and skills development. Consider, too, that the current government has made such dubious investments as handing over $372 million to Bombardier after the company laid off 2,000 Canadian workers, as well as a $100, $100 million taxpayer gift to highly profitable Ford, which then announced it would be reducing up to 600 jobs. Which part of this long, repetitive track record of failed government interventions should give us any confidence they'll get things right this time? And this continues over onto page seven, so that's where I am now. In a sad coincidence, on the same day Ban Baines unveiled his new billion dollar handout initiative, Procter & Gamble announced it would close its plant producing cleaning products in Brockville, Ontario by 2021, throwing 480 people out of work. After sh showering Bombardier and Ford with taxpayer money, it's fair to ask why Procter & Gamble didn't get a similar handout, and it's hard to conclude that the answer has anything to do with economics and everything to do with prestige. In the eyes of politicians, planes and cars mean sophisticated technology, but mops and fabric softener sheets? Sorry guys, we can't help you. The handouts are for the sexy industries only. This is the inevitable consequence of a failed approach to economic development that has government picking winners and losers instead of ensuring a business-friendly environment for all. Rather than let the market determine whether Bombardier, Ford, or Procter & Gamble should succeed or fail, the government ends up deciding. The result is that businesses that don't tick enough boxes on an arbitrary checklist pay the price. Mr. Baines may have the best of intentions with his supercluster innovation plan, but if history is any guide, the cluster it will create will be far from the super kind he has in mind. And again, that's from Aaron Wedrick, Federal Director, Canadian Taxpayers Federation. <coughs> Okay, so we're in the middle section of the paper now, and there's lots of pictures here. First of all, on page four, in the upper left-hand corner, there's a renovation picture. This is under My Nipawa. During the summer of 1997, Hazel M. Kellington School in Nipawa was a hive of activity as the south portion of the school was demolished to make way for a new addition, which included the new auditorium. These photos were taken in July of 1997 on 3rd Avenue, and this was submitted by Gail Webb. Now, Gail always has a lot of historical pictures, mainly of people that she's uh, uh, been in touch with in the past, but uh, Gail generally has a purse full of old historical pictures and I really enjoy wa looking at them. Now just below that, Nipua Youth Job Centre opens for the season and this photo is by John Drinkwater. Nipua Job Centre opened on Wednesday, May 24th and is located in the town office at 275 Hamilton Street. Melissa McFarlane, Youth Engagement Leader, sa said office hours are 8.30 a.m. to 12.15 p.m and 1 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. Monday to Friday. Community response has been encouraging. Two businesses have already requested involvement. And in the picture, Marilyn Crew on the left-hand side, Town of Nipua Economic Development Officer, and Melissa McFarland, Youth Engagement Leader. And they are officially opening the office there by cutting the ribbon. Now, the last article on page four 
The United Church celebrates 25th anniversary of sanctuary, and this is a submitted article. The congregation of the Nipah United Church is celebrating 25 years in the sanctuary that was built in 1992. Members of the original building committee are hosting a special service on Sunday, June 11th at the regular 11 a.m. Sunday worship service. Of course, no anniversary would be complete without a few nostalgic moments as we really relive some of the memorable moments of the past. Not only has the new church provided a very worshipful venue for weekly worship, but it has been the church of choice for countless baptisms, weddings, and funerals, as well as a variety of concerts. Hopefully, the event will be attended by some of those former residents who were instrumental in making this building become a reality. Clergy over the past 25 years have been invited, and of course, the invitation is open to anyone who would like to attend. The program will include a service of thanksgiving, a time of historical reminiscences, as well as a PowerPoint slide presentation including the former church and the construction phase of the current building. Following the service, a complimentary barbecue will conclude the celebration. Okay, over to page five and we have more pictures over here. Seeding green at the airport farm project and this was taken by John Drinkwater. Despite blustery winds, seeding for the airport farm project took place on fields located at Nipah Airport on Wednesday, May the 24th. The profits from the project are split between the Yellowhead Centre and the Nipah Curling Club. Justin Pollock, manager of Enns Brothers, said, We are seeding over 300 acres of canola this year. The strong winds will not affect the event and it gives us the opportunity to try out our new air seeder. <clears throat> now there's a very interesting picture just below that. Friendly wishes for upcoming retirement. And this, uh, these two photos were taken by Kate Jackman Atkinson. While it may be a bit premature, Val Jarama came home from a holiday to find her friends had been done some decorating in honor of her upcoming retirement. At the end of July, Jarama will be retiring after 35 years running her daycare. I've had great families, she said, adding it's time to move on to a new phase. She already has lots of plans to fill her time. The work on display, May 23rd, included a larger than life mannequin, and that's on the left hand side, and caricatures of her supposed former charges many of whom bear a striking resemblances, a re striking resemblance to various celebrities. Okay, the Nipah Banner is pleased to welcome Jessica Morton and Gloria Kerluck to our team. And Jessica joins the Nipah Banner, Nipah Press Production Department. Jessica grew up in the Nipah area and will be helping with page layout and building and print jobs, ad building and print jobs. She can be reached by email at pages at nipahbanner.com. And Gloria joins the Nipah Banner, Nipah Press front office. Gloria is a familiar face to our Minnedosa area customers as she joins our office after close to three years with the Minnedosa Tribune. She can be reached by email at office at nipahpress.com. Okay, we're in the sports section on page six. Nipah Cubs off to a slow start, and this is by Owen Devereaux. Much like this blasé spring, the Nipah Cubs are not off to the hottest of starts as the team has dropped two of their first three games. Their most recent matchups on the Santa Clara Baseball League schedule included a 6-6 tie with the Portage Padres on Wednesday, May 24th, and a 10-3 loss to the Austin A's on Sunday, May the 28th. Those results, coupled with Nipah's season opening loss to the Minnedosa Mavericks, 
have left the team with a 0-2-1 record. In the Cubs' home opener against Portage, Nipois Garrett Rempel pitched five innings, allowing just three hits and registering a strikeout. Cole Kirkowich came in for the final two innings, allowing only two hits, while also striking out one. On the other side of the ball, Kirkowich produced two hits at the plate and picked up a pair of runs batted in, RBI. Shane Lewandowski was the only other Cub to have a multiple hit game, going two for four with two stolen bases and two RBIs. On Sunday night, Nipua challenged Austin and fell 10-3. A starting pitcher Brody Moffat earned the W, collecting six strikeouts against five hits. Chance Dickinson came in for the save and compiled four strike strikeouts on his, of his own. With the exception of outfielder Garrett Rempel's perfect night at the plate 4-4-4, four four, the majority of Nipua's bats couldn't find a rhythm. Elsewhere along, around the league over the weekend, a rematch of last year's final ended with a similar result, a Portage victory. On Friday, May 26, the Portage Padres 2-0-1 down the Minnedosa Mavericks 2-1-0 by the score of 5-4. After week two of the schedule, only Portage and the Carberry Royals remain unbeaten. The Royals are the top team at 3-0-0, winning their most recent game on Sunday night, downing Dauphin 16-9. Those two unbeaten Cubs will match up Wednesday, May 31st in Portage of Prairie. As for the Cubs, they return to the Diamond on Wednesday as well, with a home game against Ebb and Flow Lakers, 1-2-0. First pitch is set for 7 p.m. So I'm thinking that one might be reported in the banner at the, in the reading at the end of the week. So in the picture here, Garrett Rempel gave up just three hits and five runs over five innings during Nipois 6-6 draw with the Portage Padres on Wednesday, May the 24th. Okay, now there is a submitted article just uh, below and to the right. Trail ever wanted to try trail running? Trail running is booming in popularity across the country. It is exhilarating and energizing because exercising in a natural set setting promotes emotional and mental well-being. Also, running on a softer surface reduces the stress on the joints while strengthening the large muscles of the body and the lateral stabilizing muscles. The presence of trees provides an oxygen-rich environment, shade from the sun, and shelter from the wind. An introduction to trail running event will take place Saturday, June 3rd at 8 a.m. in the Langford Recreational Trails, at the Re Langford Recreational Trails. Participants will receive running tips and be able to select a distance and a pace that they prefer. Please register by June 1st at neepski at gmail.com. So I'm going to spell that out. N-E-E-P-S-K-I at gmail.com. The Langford Recreational Trails are located 10 kilometers east of Nipah on Highway 16 and 5 kilometers south on Road 81 West. Okay, now the final picture on page six. Thumbs up on that jump. That was taken by Owen Devereaux. An unnamed student approves of this jump by Braden Gillies of Nipua during the Zone 7 Championship held on May 24th and 26th. Full results from the event will appear in the Friday, June 2nd edition of the Nipua Banner. And I'm now in the classifieds. There is a public notice um, animal control, and this comes from the town of Nipua. Dogs and cats may not run at large. This includes the ball diamonds, fairgrounds, green spaces, parks and playgrounds, and any public property with 
within the town limits. The Animal Control Bylaw number 3001 states dogs and cats must be on a leash no longer than six feet in length in custody and control of the owner or a competent person at all times. Owners must clean up after their pets with respect to defecation on public or private property and dispose of such excrement in a proper manner, collected into a doggy bag and placed in the trash. Persons may not permit their dog or cat to damage public property or private property other than that of the owner for example, digging holes. All dogs and cats must be issued a town license and tag. Failure to abide by the provisions of this bylaw is considered an offense which is subject to applicable fines and or the impoundment of the dog or cat. Thank you for your cooperation and respect. Now there's some other uh, class ads in the classifieds that you might be interested in having a look at. Um, there is an auction or two uh, listed that you might want to attend. Oh, there's lots of interesting things at the auctions in this area. Okay, finally, the last page. And this should be interesting because there's green on this, this Ferris wheel. And as you can see, and you can see right through it. Nipawan District Chamber of Commerce Fair. For the fourth straight year, the Nipawan District and Chamber of Commerce partnered with Saturn Shows Bidway during the Nipawan Fair. And this photo was taken by Owen Devereaux. And the story is by Kate Jackman Atkinson. From carnival rides to car shows, it was a busy weekend as the annual Nipah Fair came to town. Organized by the Nipah District Chamber of Commerce from May 26th to 28th, there were a wide variety of activities on offer. I think it went well, said Jeff Braun, Chamber President. Saturn Shows was set up with their midway at the Nipah Fairgrounds, which is where most of the Chamber's activities also took place. New for Friday night was live music in the indoor arena, and Braun said they had pretty good attendance, with a steady crowd for both Friday and Saturday night's performances. While attendance at the Midway was a bit slow on Friday, it was a strong weekend overall, especially Saturday. Braun said the feedback from Saturn was that it was busier than other years. Braun said they had a good response from attendees and while concrete numbers weren't available as of press de deadline, there was a lot of traffic in town or over the weekend. He was also happy to see a number of other organizations holding events to coincide with the fair weekend. There was lots of activity around town, he said, adding it was busy. With this year under their belts, they are already looking to the future. Braun said they hope to keep building off of previous years and have already talked about some potential changes for next year. The Chamber's next event will be the Parade of Lights, followed by the annual general meeting in the new year. Anyone interested in joining the Chamber can come to their meetings, which take place the second Thursday of the month upstairs at the County Courthouse. And we'll just leave you with the final picture of the day. A car show organized by the Yellowhead Roadrunners Auto Club was one of the attractions during the Nipah Fair weekend. Okay, so that's it for reading the press for today. Um, in a few days, Kathy Jasnick will be with you reading the Nipah Banner. And until then, I hope all of our viewers have a wonderful day. It is really beautiful out there today. Bye for now.